gentlemen, welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruga speaking to you. Just east of Jerusalem, Israel, today is the sixth day of the month of Kisli, 5782. It's November 9th, 2021. This coming Shabbat, we read Parashat Vayitze, and he went, beginning with Genesis 28.10, concluding Genesis 32.3. Just to recap a bit, last Thursday, as you may recall, was the Sigd holiday, the Ethiopian Jewish holiday that was uh, marked, celebrated, uh, observed many, many hundreds of years in Ethiopia and was introduced into Israel in these past few decades with the great Aliyah, with the great, uh, in, uh, what's the word, the ingathering of the Ethiopian Jewish community. And it's celebrated each year all over Israel, but the main gathering point is in Jerusalem in the Sherover Promenade, Tayelet in Hebrew, which overlooks the Temple Mount. A very beautiful open area. I was there last Thursday, and you saw many beautiful photos taken last Thursday on our Facebook page. If you happen to be looking at our Facebook page, you can still look at it now. Beautiful photos of the people uh, observing, worshiping, praying, uh, of the casing, the spiritual leaders, very colorful uh, gowns they wear and umbrellas, and just very beautiful holiday, very nice, positive feeling. Uh, and of course, the holiday is all about um, staying true to the Torah. It's all about Jerusalem, the longing for so many thousands of years to return to Jerusalem now, the great uh, gratitude toward being in Jerusalem. And they also say that on Yom Kippur, uh, we tend to our individual sins. And then uh, Sigd, 50 days later, uh, the emphasis is on communal sins, com ways that communities, that people, uh, the nation can mend its ways. So anyway, that was Sigd, and it was followed immediately by Rosh Chodesh Kislev, because Sigd is now the single holiday that appears on the in the month of Cheshvan, uh, breaking a long drought. As I've said many times, I see it as a sign, a siman in Hebrew, that the redemption has begun, and that dry spell of holidays during the month of Cheshvan has been pierced. And of course, like I said, it's followed by Rosh Chodesh Kislev. Today is the sixth day of Kislev. Kislev is the ninth month of the Hebrew calendar year when we begin with the month of Nisan, the month of Pesach, Passover, which is the new year for holidays, for marking the uh, pilgrimage festivals and the new year for kings. Kings would uh, mark their reign from the first day of Nisan. But there's also a second new year in Israel. That's more what you might call the civil new year. And that, of course, is Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, beginning of the year. And that's the year, that's the calendar year that we mark the beginning of the Shemitah sabbatical cycle. It is the calendar year that we mark the beginning and end, of course, of the Yovel, the Jubilee year. And so, anyway, however you look at it, Kislev is either the third, the ninth month of the year beginning from. Nisan, or the third month of the year beginning with Tishrei. It's a unique month because it has the holiday of Hanukkah, which is unlike any other holiday on the Hebrew calendar. It begins on the 25th day of Kislev and actually spans from Kislev into the next month of Tevet because it's an eight-day holiday. And the month of Kislev sometimes has 29 days, sometimes 30 days. That's in accordance with the calendar which was a major achievement uh, worked out by our sages many, many, many centuries ago uh, once the Sanhedrin no longer existed and eyewitnesses to the moon couldn't be accepted. Um, they came up with a, a calculation that uh, takes into account the cycles of the moon, the sun, everything, and... Uh, so we have, uh, we know each year, even without the personal 
uh, testimony from someone who's seen the new moon. We know when the new moon is to be honored, celebrated, marked. And so it turns out that sometimes in order to keep true to that calculation, the month of Kislev has 30 days, sometimes it has 29. Rosh Rosh Chodesh, the new month of Tevet, is always marked during one of the days of Kislev. Uh, and um, this year, actually, Rosh Chodesh uh, on Hanukkah will fall out also on Shabbat. They, our sages tell us that uh, the Mishkan, the tabernacle that was built in the desert, which we're going to be reading about in another, I guess, two months maybe, uh, was completed during the month of Kislev, and that Moshe actually delayed the inauguration until Nisan. We know very well that it was inaugurated in Nisan. Um, and uh, so Kislev, of course, we mentioned last year about the story of, last year, last month, the story of, of Cheshvan, that Cheshvan was disappointed because the first temple was completed in Cheshvan, but it wasn't dedicated till the following Tishrei, so Cheshvan was compensated. Hashem promised Cheshvan that the third temple would, would be uh, inaugurated in the month of Cheshvan. And here we learn that as a compensation for to the month of Kislev, uh, Hashem has uh, arranged it, I guess we can say, so that nearly a thousand years later, uh, during Hanukkah, when the second temple was rededicated, it was in the 25th day of Kislev. So, of course, um, do, do months have feelings? Um, it's probably not, but uh, I think the idea is simply that God does keep a ledger and does make sure that, uh, that there's justice and fairness in all aspects of creation. In fact, it's a very good, interesting question. I had this discussion a few weeks ago with Rav Gedalia, as you know, who presents us with our weekly Torah reading. Um, and he mentioned a, a passage in the Gemara, in the Talmud, in which the sages discuss the fact that the moon, the new moon, the crescent moon, always faces away from the sun. Uh, you know, as, as if it has its back toward the sun. And they said it's because it's ashamed, still bears some shame at its one-time attempt in creation to be equal to the sun. We know that story that God created two illuminations, luminaries in the, in the heavens, and uh, one was big and one was small, and apparently uh, the moon had vied for the crown. And was not accepted by Hashem, so the moon was diminished. And this is according to this line of reasoning why the moon is smaller than the sun, doesn't have its own light as the sun does, and goes through its cycle. So the question is, does the moon have feelings? And of course, our, everybody will say, of course not. You know, this is a, a midrash, this is a teaching in order to uh, put across some points to teach something perhaps or just to create a colorful way to remember a natural phenomenon. But I wonder, we have feelings, man has feelings, where do they come from? They're, we're created, I, I would imagine, they're part of our package. So if we have feelings, and maybe animals have feelings, why don't other objects perhaps have feelings or something that is a, a parallel to feelings, if you know what I'm saying. It's not feelings that we have, because we have a biological makeup that, or a chemical makeup that allows for those feelings to be expressed as we understand them, but maybe there's a parallel uh, mechanism going on in the moon, in the sun, in the planets, in in inanimate objects and plants. I don't know, something to think about. Why not? But I digress. Talking about the month of Kislev, Kislev is also known as a month of dreams. And again, it 
comes in the darkest time of the year when the nights are longest. So right off the bat, it makes sense. It's a month of dreams because dark month, I guess a month where we sleep more and have dreams. But it's also called the month of dreams because in this month is when so many dreams in the Torah and our weekly Torah readings take place. Of course, this week, which we're going to read very soon, I promise, is the amazing dream of Yaakov. Who lays his head down, has an amazing dream, and soon we'll be dream reading about the dreams of Yosef and the dreams of Pharaoh, all in the next few parshiot, over the next few weeks. Sometimes it, one of those final dreams actually is read uh, in the month of of Tevet, which follows Kislev, but by and large, they are all read during this month of Kislev. And in fact, if there's two other dreams in this, a few other dreams in this week's parsha, uh, Yaakov has a dream about sheep. He has a, a dream. Uh, Shem speaks to him in a dream, and Shem speaks to Lavan, uh, Yaakov's father-in-law, in a dream. So lots of dreams, and they all take place in this short time period, as far as the or readings go of the month of Kislev. So it is a month of dreams. So, you know, we all dream and um, we all have dreams. Our dreams that we have in daylight hours, that is our conscious dreams, our desires, our hopes, well, may they all come true. And those dreams that we have when we're sleeping, when we're not in control of our thoughts and our dreams, um, may they all be propitious and uh, may they uh, bespeak good things to come. It's very important that uh, we pay attention to our dreams and always try to understand and interpret them for the best. Because as we interpret our dreams, as we know from, from Yosef, as we interpret our dreams, that's how they're going to be. So if you have a dream and it seems a little bit scary, um, Interpret it in a positive way in order to in order to convince it, as it were, to have a positive uh, ramification. And if you want to share a dream with someone and it was a potentially negative dream, be very careful. Because if someone says something negative about one of your dreams, as, you know, this means something bad's going to happen, that's not good. So if you are going to share it with someone, share it with someone you trust and tell them, from the start, before you say what your dream is, you want a positive interpretation. So let's go right to Parshat Vayetze. Begins, as I mentioned earlier, chapter 28, verse 10. Hebrew, then English. Vayetze Yaakov mi be'er sheva va'elech harana va'ifka b'makom va'yalen sham ki va ha'shemesh va'yikach me'avnei ha'makom va'yasem me'ra'ashotav va'yishkav b'makom ahu Vayahalom vehine sulam mutsav arza brosho magia hashamaima vehine mal ache elohim olim yordimbo vehine ashem nitsav alav vayomer ani ashem elohe avraham avicha velohe yitzhak ha arza she ata shochev alea lacha etnena ulazar echa vahaya zar acha kafa ha arz ufaratsta yama vakedma vatsafona vanegba ונברחו בך כל המשפח, כל משפחות האדמה ובזרעך. הנה אנוכי עמך ושמעתיך בכל אשר תלך והשיבותיך על האדמה הזאת כי לא אעזבך, לא אעזבך עד אשר אם עשיתי את אשר דיברתי לך ויקץ יעקב משנתו. ויאמר אכן יש השם במקום הזה ואנוכי לא, יודע, לא ידעתי. ויורא ויאמר מה נורא המקום הזה אין זה כי אם בית אלוהים וזה שאר השמיים וישכם יעקב בבוקר ויקח את האבן אשר שם מרעשותיו וישם אותה מצבה ויצוק שמן על ראשה ויקרא את שם המקום ההוא בית אל ואולם לוז שם העיר לראשונה וידר יעקב נדר לאמור אם יהיה אלוהים עמדי ושמרני בדרך הזה אשר אנוכי הולך ונתן לי לחם לאחור ובגד ללבוש ושבתי לשלום אל בית אבי והיה השם לי לאלוהים והאבן הזאת אשר שמתי מצבה יהיה בית אלוהים וכל אשר תיתן לי אשר אסורנו לך 
that famous, famous uh, history-changing passage. Let's read it in English. Yaakov departed from Be'er Sheva and went toward Haran. He encountered the place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took from the, the stones of that place which he arranged around his head and lay in that place. And he dreamt, and behold, a ladder was set earthward and its top reaching heavenward. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, Hashem was standing over him. And he said, I am Hashem, God of Avraham, your father, and God of Yitzchak, the ground upon which you are lying. To you I will give it and to your descendants. Your offspring shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out powerfully westward, eastward, northward, and southward. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed themselves by you and by your offspring. Behold, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go and I will return you to this soil, for I will not forsake you until I will, until I will have done what I have spoken about you. Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Surely Hashem is present in this place, and I did not know. And he became frightened and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the abode of Hashem, the abode of God, and this is the gate of the heavens. Yaakov arose early in the morning and took the stone that he placed around his head and set it up as a pillar, and he poured its oil on its top, and he named that place Beit El. However, Luz was the city's name originally. Then Yaakov took a vow, saying, If God will be with me, will guard me on this way that I am going, will give me bread to eat and clothes to wear, and I will return in peace to my father's house, and Hashem will be a God to me. Then this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall become a house of God, and whatever you will give me, I shall repeatedly tithe to you. So Yaakov basically has, in one fell swoop, not only imagined the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, he has decided where it's, it's, well, he hasn't decided, but he has realized where it's going to be in that place, and he has understood the relationship between him and his descendants and Hashem, and he has vowed to give maaser, to give a tithe of everything he possesses to Hashem. And this is basically a covenant. This is a vow between Hashem and, and Yaakov. This is going to stick. And of course, at the end of the close of this week's parsha, uh, Hashem comes to Yaakov in a dream and says, Remember, remember that we had this encounter at the beginning of your journey, and I said that uh, I will return you to your land. Well, the time has come now. So, of course, Yaakov, at the end of this week's parsha, does return to the land of Israel. And, of course, the holy temple itself will not be built for many a year uh, later. But that promise, both from Yaakov and his, on behalf of himself and his descendants, and from Hashem to Yaakov and his descendants, uh, will stay uh, forever. So Yaakov is fleeing from his brother Esav, as we recall. Esav is very upset because as far as he sees it, Yaakov stole from him his blessing, the blessing of the firstborn, as surely as he tricked him out of the birthright when they were younger. And so he has said uh, that he was going to wait till his father Yitzhak dies, which is scores a big point for Esau in the hearts of our sages who said that was a very righteous thing to wait for his father because he didn't want to cause pain to his father. He had respect for Yitzhak. He had kibbut av, respect for his father, but he will wait for his father to die and then he will kill his brother out of vengeance. So overhearing this, Yaakov's mother Rivka says to Yaakov, you got to leave, you got to go to my brother, Lavan, who was in Haran, and um, when your brother Esav cools down a bit, you'll come back. In the meantime, Esav has married some local uh, Canaanite women, and Rivka and Yitzhak are not pleased with that, so Yitzhak, Rivka talks to Yitzhak, and Yitzhak talks to Yaakov, and he says, I'm sending you to Haran, to my brother-in-law Lavan, and there you will find yourself a wife because I don't want you to marry one of the local uh, Canaanite women. So now Yaakov is on his way. to es- he, one, one part of his, his, his flight is to escape his brother and the other is a mission to find himself a bride. So his first night out is what we've just read about. 
and there's so many things going on here. Um, I really don't want to skip over them, so let's just focus on it. He is on his way, and it says very interesting wording. In Hebrew, it says, and the English translation here is he encountered the place, but what it, in Hebrew means he was struck by the place. Um, he didn't just arrive at it. Something happened there, and and the next line continues and says, and spent the night there because the sun had set. So uh, sages teach us that Hashem wanted Yaakov to stop there. He wanted him to spend the night there because he wanted to share with him this dream of the holy temple. So he made the sun set. So uh, it was sort of like he was struck there. He was on his way. He was, you know, going to move right on through. But all of a sudden, boom, sooner than... than uh, expected the sunset, so he had to make camp there, which is exactly what he did. And then we are told that he took a bunch of stones and placed them around his head and lay in that place. The stones basically formed his pillow. And then he had the dream. But we're going to skip past the dream just for a moment. When he woke up, we're told that he took the stone, singular, that he placed around his head when he went to sleep the night before and set it up as a pillar. And he poured oil on its top. He, he sanctified this stone and he said that the name of the place was Beit El, which means house of God. And uh, again, it had been a number of stones. Now it's a single stone. What happened? Once again, our sages solved the conundrum. They say that he took 12 stones. Um, uh, foreseeing the future 12 tribes that would be born out of his loins, he took those 12 stones, individual stones, individual sons, which became individual tribes. And overnight, as part of his dream, but in reality, they merged into a single stone. Why? Because the power of the Mikdash, the power of the Holy Temple, is to unite the 12 tribes, to unite the Jewish people, and ultimately to unite, to, to unite all mankind. So these 12 stones merged into a single stone. And not only that, that stone, that very stone that merged into a single stone that he had rested his head upon the night before and that he now stood up and poured oil on would become the foundation stone, Evan Hashdia, the foundation stone that rests in the Holy of Holies and upon which stands the Arona Breed, the Ark of the Covenant. So a whole lot is going on here in this tiny little passage, a whole lot. So Yaakov just comes upon this place, which is the center of everything. It's the center of creation. It's, it's from that stone crea creation emerged, which is an amazing concept. Now, and that very stone where he had rested his head will become the foundation stone, the place of the Holy of Holies on Mount Moriah and the Temple Mount, where the Holy Temple stood and will stand, and where right now uh, is uh, encased in the Dome of the Rock. So that is the place of the Evan Hashdiah, the foundation stone. Uh, and also our sages teach us that this is the very place and this is the very stone that was one of the stones of the, these are the stones of the altar that Avraham made for Yitzhak, the binding of Yitzhak. So we learn here also that that place where Avraham went to, Mount Moriah, where God told him to go and to offer up his son and where the angel stayed his hand at the very last moment and where Avraham lifted his eyes saw the ram, his horns stuck in a thicket, and replaced his son with the ram, and then said, this is the place where God will see and be seen. That's it. That's this place. Beit El, the house of God, Mount Moriah, the place of the holy temple. It all comes together here. This is why God stopped Yaakov when he reached this point, because he had a, a message 
to give to Yaakov. He had a covenant to make with Yaakov. Before Yaakov would leave the land of Israel, God wanted to make sure that they had this encounter. And it was a huge encounter, as you see. And of course, the dream is just fantastic. A ladder uh, going from earth to heaven, connecting heaven and earth, as it were, creating a portal, creating a way of ascending and descending. And they are angels ascending and descending. But those angels carry our prayers. And those angels carry God's answer to our prayers. And that's the connection. That's why... That's why the, the, the Holy Temple is that place where it all comes together, where we're closest to Hashem. And that's why to this day, when Jews go up to the Temple Mount, it's so important for us to be able to pray there because it's good to pray anywhere and everywhere to Hashem. And anywhere you pray to Hashem, Hashem hears you. There's no better and, and lesser place. But all with that being said, there's no place like home. There's no place like being right there where the Akedah, where the binding of Yitzhak took place, where Yaakov uh, went to sleep and had this fantastic dream and where the Holy Temple stood and will stand. There's no place like that place to direct our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers to Hashem. So Yaakov has this dream. Hashem is standing at the top of this ladder and Hashem says to Yaakov, the land that you're sleeping on will be yours and your descendants forever. And your children will spread to the east and to the west and to the north and to the south. And again, another very colorful, beautiful midrash is that in the same fashion that all those 12 stones merged into a single one, God, as it were, rolled up the entire land of Israel. And for that moment, for the moment of, of his promised to Yaakov, the entire land of Israel was rolled up and compacted into a ball right under his head. So that promise that the place that you rest your head on, the place that you're sleeping on, will be for you, you and your children forever. He was referring to the entire land of Israel. And of course, Hashem then says, I am with you, I will guard you wherever you go, and I will return you to this soil. That's basically, in a couple of words, the the promise of, of all the Hebrew prophets that God will guard us and protect us wherever we roam, even when we're in exile, and God will return us to this land. It's all right here. You know, you could maybe it's a, a spoiler for the thousands of years to come, but um, it's, it's just a fantastic little episode here. And Yaakov awakes from his sleep, and he's terrified, naturally, because he realizes he fell asleep in this most incredible, powerful, holy place. And he just says it as it is. How awesome is this place? Again, this place. The word place is mentioned so many times, makom. And of course, it was mentioned also many times in the story of the Akedah, the story of the binding of Yitzhak and makom, which means place, as we know, is another term that refers to the Holy Temple, it's the place, it's the place. It's really, again, it's where the foundation stone is. It's, it's, it's the place, it's the crown of creation. It's the place that makes all of creation worth being created. And of course, Hamakom is also a, a, a name given to Hashem, which is very odd because Hashem's not a physical anything, so a, 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 a makom, a place, uh, is an odd, I mean, God's everywhere, but God is the place in which creation exists. God envelops creation. God, there's nothing beyond God, so he is the place. So there's so much being hinted at here in this beautiful little story and of course, it concludes with Yaakov's vow, after Hashem vowed to Yaakov that he will guard over him and return him to the land. And Yaakov vows that if Hashem will in fact um, uh, protect me and make sure I've got what to eat and what to wear, then I will, there will be a temple here and I will 
uh, give him a tenth of all that is mine. So it's a very beautiful, very concise, very precise, very powerful, and very history-shaping passage concludes. And then we're on our way. In the next line, beginning in chapter 29, verse 1, so Jacob lifted his feet and went, Yaakov lifted his feet and went toward the land of the Easterners. He looked and behold, a well in the field. And of course, this begins his beautiful, uh, very romantic encounter with Rachel, Rachel, his cousin, who he falls in love with, a love at first sight. And um, of course, she runs home to tell her father Lavan that her cousin is here. Lavan runs out to greet Yaakov. It's all very beautiful. It's all very wonderful. Yaakov will now work for Lavan. And uh, Lavan will say, what, what do I owe you? What's your, what's your pay? And Yaakov says, I want to marry your daughter, Rachel. She was very beautiful uh, in, in Yaakov's eyes. And um, Lavan readily agrees, but he says, seven years you work with me, and then I'll give you my daughter. So he works for seven years, uh, and uh, it's a big wedding. And of course, as we know, instead of uh, Rachel, Lavan, uh, he escorts his older daughter, Leah, to the bedroom. And Yaakov only finds out the next morning, and he is quite understandably... Uh, upset, and he says to Lavan, what did you do? Lavan said, listen, where, where we come from, the older daughter gets married first. He might say, fair enough, but he could have said something, huh? Anyway, this is part of a whole recurring theme in the life of Yaakov, that uh, these deceptions, you know, tricks. Um, of course, he first... Uh, took advantage of his brother Esau's hunger and purchased the birthright from him. Later on, he disguised himself as Esau and tricked his father into blessing him and not Esau. And now he's being tricked. And it won't be the last time that Yaakov's going to be on the short end of, of uh, deception. And uh, it's very painful for him. Uh, but um, apparently it was part of what he had to go through. And this, you know, you would say, well, you know, Hashem, obviously it's clear. You have Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. This is, the, this is the genealogy that Hashem is blessing. Why make Yaakov jump through so many hoops? Why make him have to be deceptive in order to get what is rightfully his. Why have others deceive him? So clearly there are many layers of, of understanding and meaning, many books, many words, much ink has been used up in explaining and trying to understand what it's all about. But as we say, you know, God works in mysterious ways and clearly... Um, this is the path that God wanted Yaakov to, to take. So Yaakov now begins his married life. As we know, 11 of his 12 sons are born while he is in Haran. Uh, the first four sons, uh, Ruven, uh, Shimon, Levi, and Judah are born to Leah. And then... She stops having children. In the meantime, Rachel uh, can have children. The next two children are born to Leah's uh, uh, servant, maid servant. Here's the music. I'm going to stop here. You can read the rest of the parashah. And a uh, beautiful, beautiful story that's just beginning. We'll be following up next week as well. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.